So today we're going to be talking about some favorite go-to lighting setups with my buddy Ian Spanier on Behind the Shot. Hi, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel, and uh, today is another one of those special episodes that I've been doing. It's it's a little bit different, and I'll get more into that later. First of all, I want to welcome back to the show our returning champion, Los Angeles-based portrait and sports and commercial photographer, Mr. Ian Spanier. Ian, how are you? Great, Steve. How are you? I'm doing so good. It's good to see you again, man. I haven't seen you since you came out this way and did a workshop out here. Yeah, that was great. Uh, get, you got to meet my college professor, which was uh, unique in itself because I had not seen him in many years as well. So oh, yeah, you had, I didn't realize when we saw him, you hadn't seen him in a while. Yeah, I kind of briefly saw him. He kind of passed through a, a portfolio review that I was at in Los Angeles. And that was the first time in probably five or six years I hadn't seen him. So really getting to sit down and have, uh, you know, cup of coffee or tea, whichever you had, uh, was great. And, you know, I really was glad that I was able to connect you guys because I thought you and he would definitely hit it off and, and have a lot to talk about. Yeah, that was fun. He was, let's, let's give a shout out, say his name and where he works. Uh, Thomas McGovern. Uh, he's retired. I think mostly now, I think he still does a little bit of stuff, uh, at Cal state Fullerton, but, uh, for the most part, I think he's, he's mostly retired, uh, from teaching. And now he's uh, still working on his own art, which is just amazing to watch because he is a true fine art photographer, uh, something he and I used to butt heads a little bit about in college. But, um, you know, that was that. It was such a great time. We went to a little place here in town called Condren Coffee, uh, downtown Riverside, and had a great conversation. Super nice guy. And I mentioned at the start, you've been on the show before. We've been friends now for for quite a while. And last time you were on, we kind of went through your whole you know, background in detail. It was January of 2019. The show was classic portraits and classic lighting. We had a great, great shot of Jeff Bridges uh, that you did. I got to tell you sometime the story. I tried getting Jeff Bridges on the show because he's a photographer. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it was right before he had some some medical issues. And so it, it didn't happen. Hopefully someday I'll be able to make that happen because that would be, he's a phenomenal photographer, takes pictures on on his movie sets. That was actually um, the first thing I said to him. I, I knew he was a photographer. I had seen his work. And so when I literally had two minutes with him. So when he walked in the room, I said, I know you're a photographer. You've seen everything from here to there. I'm not going to tell you how this is going to go. So here's where I have you for sitting. And this is what we're going to do. And we're going to just get through it. And like we talked about that day, every single frame was pretty much usable. (laughs) He was so good. Well, and it's funny because we're going to revisit that shot today. It's one of our example shots for one of your lighting setups. But we have a couple of other shots from that shoot that we're going to use as examples too. All of your links, like in the last show, I don't want to rehash everything here, but all your links will be in that show's blog post. And as well, they'll be in this show's blog post at behindtheshot.tv. If you're watching on YouTube, go down to the description. All the links are down there. It's right down there behind the, uh, or below the like button. Uh, In the description in both places, I'm going to include links all the way. Your books are still available, right? Playboy, The Book of Cigars, and Local Heroes, Portraits, of American volunteer firefighters. Those are still available? Yes. And uh, I'm happy to tell you, I'm actually working on another book. It should be out in quarter four. However, I cannot tell you what it is yet. <laughs> so okay. I think think the announcement's in September. So I will update you as soon as I am legally allowed to say what it is. Uh, but the good thing is I can tell you one thing is that one of the modifiers we're going to be talking about, I was field testing it for the entire project. Okay. That's that actually, I was just about to interrupt you and and say, can we talk about what it is, but you are, you are, uh, using, we'll get into it in a minute, but he's got a new light modifier out. That's pretty awesome looking. So before we dive into the topic today, and I'm going to explain to people, I started by saying this show was a little bit different. I will explain how it's different coming up in a second, but first I want to jump into you just really quick. How do you describe, quick recap of you, for those that didn't see the the original show you were on yet, hopefully they'll go back and watch it, how do you describe yourself photography-wise? I, I always consider myself a portrait photographer. So, you know, this is something that over the course of, you know, 20 plus years of, of trying to define what I am and who I am, I, I literally have shot nearly every subject at some point or another. So... I sort of started out here and here, and then as the years got along, I started to move a little bit more towards the center, partially from the environment I'm in, meaning the um, 
landscape of commercial photography. And partially because uh, I started to just be more attracted to certain things. Um, some things were taken away from me. Some things were just navigated naturally. Um, so I do consider myself at the end of the day, a portrait photographer. That's what I do. It doesn't okay. mean to say that I can't shoot travel and I can't shoot food and I can't uh, do still life because I do all that too. However, when it comes to focusing my career path and what work I share and what work I show uh, in order to promote myself and get more work, it's I would call it in the portrait arena. Now, fitness has come into that. And that was one of those things that just kind of came naturally. I actually went to college originally to do sports medicine. So athletics and sports were always part of my life. I don't think we talked about this before, but um, realistically, I never planned to shoot fitness. It just happened. And then it's just one of those things I sort of understood. I'm into fitness myself. So I know um, my way around the gym and photographing it just, it just happened naturally. Um, you know, but that industry's changed too. Uh, I don't do as much as I used to. I still work for uh, some fitness companies like Bodybuilding, or sorry, um, Beachbody, and um, some other nutrition companies here and there. But a lot of the magazines are gone, so a lot of that work has sort of dried up, and it's allowed me to focus more on celebrity portraiture and real people portraiture, which is really where I, I would say most of my work is these days. And and it's funny because I I know you for those two mainly. You, you do so much celebrity portraiture that I'm such a fan of, but a lot of what I originally saw in your work was a lot of that fitness stuff. And, and I would argue you have an ability, I'm trying to think how to word this. You, you have an ability to, um, to show muscle groups, to really show the definition of an athlete or whatever it might be, uh, better than most people I, I know. Most people it's a dodging and burning or it's so accentuated that it looks like, you know, something Stan Lee drew. Whereas you very, very naturally, you, you have an ability to show somebody's physique in, in very natural way using the lighting that you do. You're not just a photographer though. I mean, you, I mentioned you've got books, you've got the new book coming out. So you're an author, educator. You came out here, did, did that workshop. You're an ambassador for like, 9 million companies, Think Tank Photo, which I live on Think Tank gear, Hoodman USA, Sekonic, uh, Cam Ranger, you're a Westcott top pro, which kind of brings us to that new light uh, modifier. You have with Westcott a new, what they call a deep umbrella from Westcott. We're going to get into that later. I'll show some examples of it later. I'll show the product right now, but um, we'll get into showing some examples of that light as we talk different lighting setups. What I'm really curious about though, is how does it come about that Ian Spaniard designs a light and ends up working with Westcott on it? Sure. Uh, I should also mention, we forgot spider. Uh, that's another. Oh, group, spider, spider, spider holster. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, you sure. live on your spider um, holster. By the way. Love that thing. Love yeah, it. Okay. <laughs> Everybody always is like, what is that? What is that? Um, so I didn't design a light. I designed a light modifier. I'm not an electronics guy whatsoever. Right. You, you, know, you, you definitely got me on all those fronts. Um, but what basically happened was I was having a conversation with one of the, um, the top guys at Westcott about you know, designing a modifier. And he said, well, what, do you, what, what would you want? And that opens up <laughs> a Pandora's box, of course. But one thing I'd really thought about, especially coming sort of out of the pandemic, not really out of it, is how many jobs I've had to do alone as a result of smaller sets, um, how many times I've had to travel by myself so I have to minimize my gear, um, might be a quick in and out trip, so I can't really deal with a lot of equipment. And so what I had sort of discussed with him was what I really would love is a something like the Rapid Box Beauty Disc dish, which we're going to talk about, which is one of my, you know, definite hundred percent go to take to the deserted Island, you know, one modifier story. That's the one I would definitely love to have with me. However, it's not something, yes, you can carry it. It has a little strap. It can go over your shoulder, all that, but I want it to get even smaller. How, how compact can we get, but still make a modification of of a light source that's going to speak to the kind of photography that I do. And I love Westcott's deep umbrellas. So I started to play off that idea. I'd also been shooting a lot with their umbrellas over the last couple of years. 
really realizing that they're inexpensive. Um, they are easily transportable. They take up very little real estate in terms of the gear when you're carrying up gear, whether by yourself or with a crew. Um, so in that line of thinking, I said, well, I want to create a deep umbrella so that it has the quality of light that I like that I can have some diffusion on top of. So you, you see the example on your screen doesn't have the diffusion on it, but it does have a, a sheet of diffusion that we can put on it. And that allows for an extremely small sort of, I don't want to call it footprint because it's not on the ground per se, but it, a modification of numerous kinds of lights. I've used this with the FJ400 series lights, which are their you know, kind of bigger monoblocks. And as of late, I've been doing a lot with the FJ200s, which are a half version of those FJ400s and as well the FJ80, which is sort of like a step up from a speed light. Um, right. And those three are uh, like with this, it, it's like, whoa, what did I just do? I can throw a light in a backpack, throw this thing on the side in the, in the little pouch on the side, and I can travel anywhere. And handhold it. I can put it on a stand. I can do all these different things with it and get different qualities of light out of one source, even though it doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles. So let, let me ask this really quick. I promise we're going to get into the lighting folks, but I, I, I as you're talking, I'm thinking, cause it's a 24 inch silver inside deep umbrella still going to have, and you can put a diffusion material on the front of it, somewhat similar to a 20, a Westcott 24 inch softbox, but this is going to give you different dispersion than that softbox would. W what are you going to get different from this in a, in a softbox? I, I think this is like sort of the thing that people who are looking to learn and understand more about lighting need to kind of wrap their head around this idea that whatever you're doing in front of that light or putting that light within is going to modify the quality of light. And that's what it's all about, that quality of light. And okay. the, the eye of the beholder aspect of that is that the, the modifier that speaks to you may not speak to somebody else. So you need to decide on your own, what modification do I like? And as we've talked about, I think, in the past, a lot of my knowledge about this stuff is self-taught. A lot of it is based on the natural world. So I'm looking at what the sun is doing and then basing ideas off that and then trying to recreate that, whether I'm in a studio or on location, and what modifiers are going to allow me to do that. So the ideas are born from what I'm looking at in the natural world. How is the sun at this time of day with, with clouds, without clouds, bouncing off that building, reflecting off this glass, uh, refracted, you know, all these modifications, warm, cold, specular, you know, these are all the th right. sort of things that are floating around in my head. There is a white version of this as well, I should mention. So there is a white interior and a silver interior. Me personally, I like the silver with the diffusion because it's sort of pop and soft at the same time, which speaks to, to my style. Um, doesn't mean to say I wouldn't use the white one if I was doing a beauty portrait or maybe something that spoke that way. And we'll get into that when we talk about the lighting, because there's a lot of psychological aspects to how I light as well. Okay. Um, so to answer your question in brief, it really is that it's just a slightly different quality of light than what you'd get from a beauty dish, which if you look inside a beauty dish, it has a metal plate that the light is actually bouncing into the metal plate, then back against the back of the uh, beauty dish and then spreading around. So it, it's a different quality versus what you have here where you have light directly going at your subject then you put a sheet of diffusion in front of that, it changes that quality of light. So it's two very different styles in a very subtle way. 99 okay. out of 100 people are not going to see that difference, but photographers see it and we respond to it. Okay. So normally in, in shows, I don't know if I did this the first time that you were on, but normally in shows now I do a couple of speed rounds. Usually it's a speed round at the end. I want to do a speed round at the start of this one as well. Uh, because I do want to get into the light setups, but I have a couple of just basic generic lighting questions. Number one is, what's the most misunderstood aspect of lighting people? Um, oh, that's a tough one. Um, I think there's a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think, you know, what I see probably is is the thing that, if you want to say the word offends me the most, <laughs> I don't know if it's correct, but 
uh, when photographers think that just throwing a uh, flash on top of their camera and they're done. They got to move that thing off camera. It doesn't always look good on camera. Uh, yeah, that works fine for on the run kind of stuff. But Red carpet, the, the, event, yeah. Sort of, but even the good paparazzi guys, they have it in their hand right. off camera. And they're directing that light. You are a director as a photographer. And that, I think, is the thing that photographers forget. They don't realize how much they are directing that picture. You're deciding when to push that button. You're deciding the composition of the frame. You are the director of your story that you're creating that day. You're even creating the story. You're telling a story about the person in front of that lens. And what's that? I think it's Avedon saying that there, there's two people in a portrait the photographer and the subject. And that is very, very true. So I don't know if that applies directly to the idea of what are they doing wrong kind of thing. It's more, what are they not doing right? Does that make sense? Okay. Yep. Makes total sense. All right. Question number two, speed round number one. Tell me about the differences, you know, just overview, helicopter view, the differences that people need to understand between lighting men versus women. And I guess for that matter as well, uh, different skin tones. Okay. So I'm going to switch that one up on you a little bit as well. Okay. It's not about that. It's about lighting to tell a story. This is my mentality across the board. I don't care if it's old, young men, woman, whatever, dog, okay. cat, turtle, <laughs> whatever the story I'm telling, that's how I decide on the light. So when you get in the commercial space, you might be taking in other factors. What is the magazine's voice? What is the story about? Is it a story about a daughter who's giving her father her kidney? Or is it a story of a rock and roll legend and you're doing a portrait of that person? And based on that, I start to formulate the idea of how would I light this to help push that story? So if it's, you know, we've talked about Steven Tyler in the past. So if it's Steven right. Tyler... He's a rock star. I'm lighting him like a rock star. If it's a story about the daughter giving her father a kid, and this is a real example that I'm giving you, um, shot for Marie Claire magazine, that story needs a softness to it. And so psychologically speaking, I'm going to light that with a soft quality of light. This girl's a hero, so I do need it to feel sort of heroic. So that's where that crossover of the rock star and the hero uh, daughter sort of happen. So it might be a bigger, softer light source in order to kind of give a kindness to the story. Right. right? Um, then how I compose it might be somewhat heroic. I might shoot a little up on her to make her more of a hero because that's the story we're telling. I would argue always that when you thumb through a magazine, I know people look at online magazines more these days than anything else, but if you're looking at the pictures, you're not reading the words. And I'm, I'm saying that not just as a photographer who's you know biased in that way, but more so that that's what draws you in. It's the same thing with book covers. You might be walking through a bookstore or on Amazon or whatever, see a cool book cover and be like, oh, what's that? You know, let's say and then you read like, the title. Yeah, you let's say you like horses, and and it's a book cover of horses. You might be like, "Oh, what's that?" And it could be about you know something completely different, but you got drawn in by the photograph, and that that's always how I approach commercial assignments. And then, of course, when you get to advertising, you know, again, it's about telling something very specific, and how can I use light to help tell that story? It, okay. First of all, let me just say, I love your story of, of the girl donating the kidney because I'm a kidney donor. So oh. I, I love that you did that. Uh, any differences in how you would light uh, African-American skin versus, you know, other people of color versus Caucasian? Do, do, in other words, you know, is that when you go for, uh, you know, I've always heard some people want to use a silver reflector for this, but a gold reflector for this, but you know, the, the umbrella comes in silver or, or white. What, what's the main change that you do when lighting different tones? Sure. I might take into account someone's skin tone, but it doesn't necessarily dictate how I'm going to light them. Okay. Um, when I first came out here, I got uh, Simon to, to photograph uh, Tyrese, the actor, writer, singer. Um, he, his uh, agency asked me, do you know how to light black people? <laughs> I was like, I know how to light. That was my answer. <laughs> and that was it. Now, nobody believed it until we were there. And once he saw the first picture, 
he was like, all right, you're good, right? Agents were, you're good, right? Now I can tell you right now, we did seven different setups that day. Not one was lit the same. There was no magic formula of I'm always going to use a gold uh, insert. Uh, I'm always going to warm it up. I'm always going to cool it off. Do this, do that. No, I changed up every single one. I made it look like we shot him for seven days and and then some, and even used natural light and even used window light. And so direct sun, indirect sun, open shade. I just did it all. I basically made a portfolio that day for this guy. And the truth of the matter is it's good light is good light. Yes, you can modify it to maybe enhance somebody's skin tone, but it doesn't mean there's a magic formula that says, well, if they're Caucasian, this is how you do it. If they're right. African American, this is how you do it. If they're Latina, this is how you do it. Again, it goes back to that story you're telling. One, two, you have a beautiful slider in Lightroom, Aperture, Capture One, whatever you're using to dictate the warmth or coolness of an image. And depending on where you go with that, can change that image as well. So let's just say, for argument's sake, you capture the very first shot we did with Tyrese was just a straight up beauty dish, right? White interior piece of diffusion, hard, mostly hard light. Light was pretty far away, meaning it's a hard uh, source coming at him. And um, I think I had the color temperature probably about 5750, I was, I'm going to say, just because that's sort of a number that stuck in my head. Um, and his skin looked fantastic. And it was more about what is this modifier that I'm putting in front of the light that's going to prove to them that I know what I'm doing. And then okay. from there we did, I mean, we did a blue tone look. We did a, a, a silver look on a highlight along his edge, you know, everything because it's the angles that are right. It's the modifiers that are right. It's all those things. All right. So before we get into Ian's kind of favorite go-to lighting setups, a couple things. First of all, this show is a podcast first and foremost. So if you're watching this on YouTube, the show notes are down below, but it's not the full show notes. You can find all the links and all of the show notes over at BehindTheShot.tv. The podcast itself, If again, if you're watching on YouTube and you like podcasts, you can get the show wherever you get your podcasts in two different formats. When you search for Behind the Shot in your podcast app uh, of choice, you'll find Behind the Shot and Behind the Shot video. So the video is available in places other than YouTube, but of course on YouTube as well. And most of the show notes and all the links are down on YouTube as well. I also want to thank my friends over at DVE store, dvestore.com for all your digital video equipment needs. And I mentioned at the start of this, that today is a little different. Let me explain really quick. And then we're going to dive in. I'm going to do this as fast as I can, but at the same time, I want to be really clear. If you're used to the normal behind the shot show, this one's going to flow a little bit differently. Normally on behind the shot, it's one photo. It's behind the shot, right? Why somebody made the choices, how they created, made, thought of a particular image. We take one photo, we dissect it. We look at that one photo through multiple aspects, planning, pre-visualization, exposure, posing, post-production, and of course, lighting. Well, today we're reversing it. We're doing this actually for the second time, right? The first show that I did this on was just recently, like a month ago, released uh, with Vanessa Joy. We did just on posing through four different scenarios, solo, couples, groups, et cetera. Go check that one out if you're interested. But so this one, we're going to look at multiple photos through that one lens of, for nice pun, that one lens of lighting. We're going to look at four of Ian's go-to lighting setups as follows. We're going to look at constant light, specifically LED lighting. We're going to look at umbrellas. We'll talk about single, double, even triple use of umbrellas. We're going to talk about beauty dishes, which is a favorite of Ian, and I've seen him use those. We're going to talk about combining those modifiers, like using a beauty dish with umbrellas, and as a bonus, that new deep uh, umbrella that he did with Westcott, we're going to show some examples from that one and discuss it a little bit more. And the goal here is that as we discuss each of these, Ian is going to describe the different characteristics that each modifier gives him and why he sets them up the way that he does, how far they are from the subject, what angle he's shooting at, and why he would pick a beauty dish over an umbrella, over his well-known, if you know Ian at all, his well-known double umbrella setup, based on the location that he's in, the space that he has, the intended use, the intended story, the subject that's in front of him, 
And what I'm hoping here, the reason I'm doing these kind of special episodes is I'm hoping that if you're one of those people that's nervous getting started on lighting, or maybe you've started on lighting and you're looking to, you know, you're one of those people who you're comfortable doing lighting, but you don't do it in your head fast. So when you're on a job site and you've got that client or that artist or whoever in front of you, and you're like, oh, I, I can't look like I'm thinking because they're going to think I don't know what I'm doing. We're hoping that that talking about some kind of tested, proven lighting setups will help you get over those fears, speed up your jobs, and let you shoot with lighting a little more comfortably. Um, now, last thing. Normally, because it's only one photo, I describe it in full. Today, we've got almost uh, like 30 plus photos. If you're listening on the audio feed, don't let that freak you out. In each scenario, this is going to be a little different there. You don't need the pictures. In each scenario, we're going to describe the setup, talk about why it's used. The photos are really just supporting information. However, if you want to see them, all the photos are over at BehindTheShot.tv. So, Ian, you ready to get started with uh, with lighting example number one? Well, I'm really hoping they're going to want to see the pictures after yeah, we describe yeah. I mean, them. <laughs> yeah. Again, the pictures are at BehindTheShot.tv. If you're watching the video, I'm going to bring them up on screen. But if you are on audio, because a lot about 50% of the audience, 50 to 53, whatever percent, they listen while they're driving. Please don't browse your phone and the <laughs> yeah, internet do while yeah. you're driving. Okay. Don't come back to me on that one. But <laughs> if you need to see the pictures or you know what you can do, pull over, look at all the pictures. I've got them categorized on the website too. And the categories we're going to talk about. So look at all the pictures, then start driving again and listen. So let's get into, uh, to, you know, setup number one, which is your constant led light. And I'm going to do this with each of these categories. First of all, I'm going to show a particular picture of the result of that shot. And then once we do that, I will go ahead and jump to showing a behind the scenes. So this is a well-known actor. Uh, the gentleman's name is? Robert Patrick. Robert Patrick. You'll know him from Terminator. He's been in a bunch of other things. I just saw him in something recently. I can't remember what uh, it was. He was in Peacemaker uh, most recently, I think. Um, he's got a few movies out right now, a couple other shows. And, and uh, what was the one where the guy got pulled up into the uh, UFO uh, fire in the sky, I think it's called. Yeah, he's a yep, phenomenal he was, actor. Yeah, I, I love yeah. his work. You can Sons tell in the sh- yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, you can tell he's totally comfortable in front of a, a camera, but I want to kind of get into the behind the scenes here, which is him standing in front of a backdrop. You seem to use backdrops a lot that you take on jobs, which I find interesting. And then you have, is this one LED? At yes. Him? Yeah, so basically what we're looking at here is, well, we're in my living room, which is pretty amazing that I got him to come to my house. (laughs) Um, But basically, uh, I had the kitchen sink going in there. So you'll see some other, if you do look at the pictures, you'll see some other equipment there. What you're seeing is, is one of many setups that I did that day with him. And again, similar to the story I just told about Tyrese, I maximize my shoots. So uh, sure, of course, there's a lot of shoots that I do where I'm just using one style of lighting. But if I'm doing a portrait of somebody, quite often I will do different lighting styles in order to get different feelings. You know, light has a feeling in my book. So if you're going for a different feeling, that happens by modifying lights, by using different you know, qualities of light, sources of light. You're going to hear me say that quality of light a lot probably. But an LED like this one, which is the Westcott Solix 2, which has both brightness and color temperature controls built in uh, that you can just simply dial on the back and barn doors, that's all it is. Yes, you can put other modifiers on top of it or in front of it, but I love using it straight up. It's almost like shooting with the sun that I can control. So what you see in this image is like you described, there's a background that I shot him against, which is just a piece of black velvet, which is something I carry with me on pretty much every shoot, whether it's as a backdrop or even as a flag or even as a coverage for the ground in front of my subject, if they're in bright sun and they are getting a lot of light in their eyes, it's the same as uh, baseball and football players do with the, the charcoal under the eyes. So super useful. Plus, you can cover your equipment in the back of your car and people can't see it in the right. window, which is a nice trick too. Uh, so yeah, all you see here is is really just this one simple light source going right 
at him. And then it's me directing him to the best spot so that I can utilize that light in the way that I kind of envision. And what the images you have show two different ways that I did this. So before I go to those other images, explain to me why you would choose, you know, obviously you kind of said the characteristics of LED light. Uh, I'm assuming one would also be space, but you do need electricity for this. Uh, or is it battery? Is this one battery powered? It's not. They do have a new series out that are battery powered, a um, little less wattage, but um, they're pretty damn cool. I will say that. They're it, okay. probably more for video people than stills. Um, but uh, this is one of the few things I own that plug in. I'm very portable. I, I like portable lights. So preferred angle, height, distance. This is taller than him. You got it a little over his head. It looks like it's almost straight on to him. It doesn't look like it's at much of an angle. And it's hard to say, but it looks like about the width of that fan. So is this about three feet away? So I would say that this one's pretty close. Yeah, you're probably right about three or four feet away. Um, part of that is because of power. Um, I'm still in the old school of trying to shoot at the lowest ISO as possible, even though my camera can handle uh, 6,000 ISO, no problem. Uh, I tend to try to keep it as low as possible. So for an LED like this I, and no other light source uh, being in the space, I will often put it pretty close to my subject, which of course softens it. It does have sort of a, a, a soft dome over the LED itself. So it's it's got a different quality in that way. But basically uh, what you kind of can't tell from this angle is that the barn doors are shut down pretty tight. So I'm focusing that light onto him. So that hardens that light a little bit because it's, it's almost like what happens when you go through a grid. It does uh, start to harden that light a little bit. And that also keeps it off that background. So it's a black background. But if you're looking at this image, you can see he's pretty close to that background. Normally, velvet eats up light pretty well. But normally, you would see that background as well to some degree. Um, the, the second example you have here is a different person, but same exact setup, just a different angle of the light. I brought it around to the side a bit more. Okay. And then here's one. And same thing. Yeah. Of Robert Patrick looking right at the camera, pointing right at the camera. I love that his hand actually is in shadow, but that light is right on his face. Beautiful. So let me ask you this just to confirm though. And this first shot again, just so nice. The umbrella here, though, was for a different different shoot. Correct. You can actually see the FJ400 strobe is sitting on the top of that stand with the umbrella. That was standby for a different shot. Okay. So let's jump to umbrellas. Anything that I missed on LED that you, you want to add? The only thing I would probably add is just the reason behind a continuous light, which is a question I think gets asked most often, is the WYSIWYG formula. What you see is what you get. So for those of you who are sort of learning light and want to understand it, no better teacher than the sun. I'll tell you that every day. The use of something that's continuous, even if it's a $5 Home Depot straight bulb with a silver reflector around it, it will teach you when you put the light in different position, what it looks like. And then you can start to formulate the formulas that you're going to use as you go along. The light being 45 degree angle, straight on, high, low, same height as your subject's face. All those variations create a different feel and a different quality to the light. So uh, even distance, closer is softer, further away is harder. The easiest way to remember that is the sun. The sun is thousands of millions, millions of miles away. It's a very hard source when it's a clean sun. So think about those things and then you start to utilize that and then perfectly moving into the next subject, this is where you can then apply that to strobe. People are so intimidated by strobes because they don't know what's going to happen. But if you understand what light does when it's a continuous light, it's the same thing with strobe. It's just a quicker version of it. Which gives you most of the time also the, the option to have more power, right? Quite often it's more power, um, more versatility if you're working on location, because now you can create light where there is no light. Um, you don't have to necessarily plug in. You can, a lot of strobes are plug in um, as well. And if we're talking about, you know, speed lights, 
going all the way up to the heavier big boys. Um, there's more power that allows you to put more modification in front of it, which allows you to have different feeling to the light. Okay. So let's jump into setup number two, which in this case is the way that you use umbrellas. And the logic would dictate that Steve would put the pictures in an order that you started with one, and then you went to two, and then you went to three. But Steve did not do that. And Steve didn't do that for a reason. I'll kind of hopefully explain as we go through. But this is a resulting shot of an umbrella. And it's being used outdoors, girl against the rocks, kind of in a pose with a nice white dress, beautifully exposed, by the way. I mean, Thank like a, no clipping on the dress, no nothing. And this is the setup. And this, by the way, is what I think of when you and I talk about your, which we've done, your dual umbrella setup. So let's start with just umbrellas in general. Uh, from a characteristic point of view, umbrellas come in here, you have two different sizes, right? You've got a small one straight on, and you've got a monstrous thing up high coming down at a 45 degree angle, right? So the small one is right behind you or to your left coming straight at the person, and the other one is shooting down on the person. What are the characteristics that you get from umbrellas in general? And what does the size do to that before we get into the stacking? So typically, I'll kind of work backwards there. The, the bigger the source, the bigger the feel of the light. So if you can imagine that you have a light bouncing into an umbrella, it's going to spread around that umbrella and then kick back towards your subject. Depending on if the umbrella is white or silver will determine whether it's a cleaner feel to it, which was what you'd get from a white umbrella or a more specular quality of light, which would be what the silver umbrella re, uh, results in. Now, when you throw a sheet of diffusion over that in the front of the umbrella, the big open part of the umbrella, then that changes that quality of light as well. It then softens that. So if you have a combination of specular light from a silver umbrella with white diffusion, you get a little bit of both. So I like to call it you know, soft with a little bit of pop. And that's why I tend to okay. lean towards that silver. Um, the Well, and the diffusion is kind of like what, when you were using your sun example, the first thought that hit me was, and everybody knows what happens when a cloud passes in front of the sun. And that's exactly it. And when I talk about the idea that most of my knowledge comes from the natural world, here's a great example of that. Because if you have a day where you may have, let's say, light cloud coverage, and maybe you can see that little round disc in the sky that if you really took a look at what the quality of light is that comes out of a sky like that, that's very similar to what this is. You have a source of light that is coming through in a, an opaque surface. And so it spreads it out, it softens it, it makes it a little bit more beautiful. So if you were to be looking at the original picture that you showed, there's a softness to that light. That's very much, much so directed from that big seven foot umbrella that you're uh, referring to. So the other important aspect of what uh, my, my good friend, Andy French, who's a fantastic photographer in New York and educator, um, he calls this the Spaniard stack. And so I, I give him credit every time <laughs> because I would never call it that, but he, he made it up and now I feel like I have to say it every time. Um, but what this stack does uh, that I think a lot of people miss out on and I, describe in detail every time is that there is a ratio at play here that's very important. It doesn't work without the ratio. So if the power of these two strobes was identical, it wouldn't look like what you're seeing. And okay. A big and, part and so of, yeah, before yeah. you go into that part, I apologize interrupting, but I just want to be clear for those on the audio. Again, Ian is shooting straight on on this model and just to his left is what looks like a 24 inch diffused umbrella. And the umbrellas that we're talking about, I want to be clear, are reflected umbrellas. So these are not shoot through umbrellas, but it's, you know, black back, strobe is in the front, shining into the umbrella and then reflecting back out. Then from that small one right behind his shoulder, up above is this gigantic, you know, probably 60 inch whatever umbrella, also diffused, shooting down at about a, I'd probably say really like a 40, 45, not really 45, 40 degree angle um, 
from, again, just the left of that smaller umbrella. So I apologize. Go ahead with what you were no, saying. No, uh, and sorry, I'll correct you on one thing. That's a 43-inch deep umbrella that you see the there. The small one? The smaller one, yes. It just looks small compared to the seven foot. <laughs> Wait, yeah. so the big one is seven foot? The big one is a seven foot umbrella. The smaller one is 43 inches. Wow. Okay, go ahead. Now, when we talked about Jeff Bridges, that was lit with two 43 inch umbrellas, both deep umbrellas. Okay. So uh, just to be clear on that. Um, so now what you also see here, which only doesn't, you know, only you could see in the video, which this video is available on Westcott U. Um, the wind was wicked <laughs> that day. So the seven foot's actually spinning a little bit because of the wind. Uh, it's a big sail if you think about it. So uh, in a studio or a more controlled environment, those two surfaces might be more correct. So they might be, you know, sort of hitting the same way. That said, what we got out of this little bit of feathering that happened from the umbrella is even softer light because it's not a direct hit of uh, the angle of the center of that seven foot umbrella hitting our model. It's actually the edge, which right. means a little bit softer light. So it works out fine. In uh, fact, happy, the, the, the strobe that's in there is kind of, if you drew a line from that strobe and the pole center, it looks like it's pointing towards her belly actually. So you're correct. Yeah. yeah. It's a okay. little low. It's a little low for what it should be. So she's sort of picking up the top half, if not top 75% of that, uh, that, uh, that big umbrella. Now going back to what I was saying about the ratio, that's what's most important to know, know about this setup is that there's a, a stop difference between the umbrella that's on top, which is the seven foot, which we'll call our key light and the umbrella that's beneath it. Now I generally do this in a two or three stop difference, depending on what I'm shooting. And again, it goes back to what's the story I'm telling. So what that 43 inch deep umbrella is actually doing is filling in shadows, which is very useful when you're photographing, let's say a cowboy or a baseball player who wears one of these things, which I'm pointing at my baseball cap, which I wear pretty much all the time. Uh, and you, if you were only to do a portrait of me, when I put my head down, that shadow is going right over my eyes if there's no fill. So that's what initially was sort of the thought process with the stack for me was I can shoot a lot of different subjects. And if they came in with a hat, I'm not having to move my key light because I have a natural fill and I can always turn it up or turn it down. And right. the importance of controlling those two individual lights, I can't express enough. It's controlling the light, directing the light. These are the things that I'm always trying to do. Control and direct that light. And whether it's natural light or strobe or continuous, it's all about how can I control the light to tell the story that I'm trying to tell. So just again, just to recap though, whatever your key light is, seven foot in this case, could be a one, two, three stop difference on that fill, depending on what it is you're photographing, those story you want to tell. Is there a prefer so how far away are these from her? Do you know? Uh, I would say these are probably about seven, 10 feet at most. Uh, really gave some, I had to shoot a lot of horizontal images because this was going to live in a video and on the web a lot. So uh, I needed it from a, a distance enough that it wouldn't blow out the rock on the left of my um, frame. And at the same time, uh, this is something that could be moved in or out depending on what I'm going for. Um, okay. We had plenty of power. You know, you have two 400 watt strobes going here, and we're not using them at full power. We're working in open shade. Uh, the sun is, as you can sort of see in the image, the sun is behind the, the rock to my left, but it's non existent as far as she is concerned. I believe, uh, if I'm correct, in the video, they show with and without strobe. And the difference between the image and what you get by controlling the light with those strobes and the umbrellas. Okay. So I'm going to just run really quickly through a couple of other examples uh, that you might get from this type of umbrella type lighting, whether it be one, you know, or your stack or whatever. Here's the shot that we originally discussed on the first show, which you already said was two smaller umbrellas still in a stacked environment. But again, yeah. just I love your your use here. Go back and watch that episode, folks, if you want to know more about how this shot was made. But here's two other ones from this shoot. 
And again, here, your composition of the frame within the frame with that little divider, we talked about this in the first show, with yeah. that little like shadow divider making it look like stacked walls in the back was just so smart. Um, just lovely light. But here's some other examples of where you might use the stacked umbrella. So this again, is that the seven foot and the 43 again? Correct. So exact same as the first shot. Um, this is why we call it go-to, right? <laughs> we know it works. Um, okay. And my client on this one, you know, responded to another image of mine, which was lit with that exact setup. So uh, why not use the same one? And this is Bob Odenkirk of Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, a bunch of other things. And then here's a couple of shots with Bob Odenkirk using the same type of a, a, a lighting setup. Beautiful fashion model here. And what I, the part of the reason I wanted to include this one is I want people to understand this lighting setup, this is so perfect the way you describe it that you're telling a story. It doesn't matter if it's an actor sitting at a table, if it's a studio shot like the Jeff Bridges one that feels more studio, if it's a fashion model, it, it doesn't really matter what it is that you're doing. Now, this one, though, looks like one umbrella. Is that correct or am I missing? Yeah, one? actually, the, the previous one was a single umbrella as well. Okay. Um, and here we have another example of that, which is to say that, you know, there are times where one light is enough. And I talk about this quite often in my work in that. If I can do it with one light, I'm always just going to use one light. It, it's so much easier. I will cheat this one a little bit and correct that it is actually two lights in, in this situation only because the way that I sort of closed him in in this setup, which is uh, I took two X-drops, which are these sort of portable backgrounds that Westcott makes, and I made a corner a la Irving Penn, which is something I do quite often sort of to pay homage to one of my favorites. And because of his dark clothing and the setup and the high angle that I have the key light, the umbrella uh, on him, I took a bare head and I just bounced it into the ceiling to open up the room a little bit. So it just sort of adds, uh, I think it was a at least two stop under difference, but it allows for some of the sort of shadows to open up a little bit. It gives me more room to play with once I get to post. And this is something I'll do quite often to not necessarily change the, the quality of that single light setup, but more so to give me more information in the file, which is super important, even if I end up going dark in the post. Is that that light I see on the upper left to the left of the umbrella? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So the, the top part is cut off, but it's just basically a reflector going straight into the ceiling. Here's the same first model, but with a single umbrella on location, mm -hmm. somebody yes. holding it, which is, which is nice. And yes. you with it, by the way, I got to go back to that one. And you with your backpack. Of course, Think Tank uh, got me covered. <laughs> Absolutely love that. Here again, uh, model, same model, different outfit, or at least the jean jacket on now, and somebody holding it looks like the large umbrella. Yeah, that's the seven foot again with the diffusion. And in this case, we were explaining how working on location with wind and all the other variables that you face, and at a time of day where the light was actually not great, so... The sun is behind her. I'm using the sun as my second light, which I think people neglect to, to realize that the sun can always be another light. So you can go out there in the field with one light, one strobe, and use the sun as your second source, be it a highlight or a front light, and use the strobe for either the highlight or the front light. So here I was showing uh, an example of how to use the sun as a second light by lighting my subject from the front and controlling the light exactly to where I want it to be and how it appears on my subject from the front side and then using the sun pretty much as a hair light and a shoulder light in this situation. And you can see the light on the back of her shoulder. Correct. Uh, you know, glistening a little bit on her hair. And last but not least on umbrellas is this one, which is, this one's interesting to me. Yeah, this was it's my three Mickey umbrellas. Mouse idea. <laughs> I don't know why. It's I came three up umbrellas, this one. but wouldn't this the way these are set up? Wouldn't this just be a wall of light? In essence, yes. Um, so this was for the cover of a yoga magazine, and we're on location. It was crazy hot in the studio that day. One of our our subjects actually passed out, which was really bad. But um, I think it was about ninety five degrees in the studio that day. So I just had this idea of creating a feel of big window light. And in order to do that, utilizing one seven foot umbrella, one 43 inch umbrella, 
might not have been enough. So I wanted more light to be moving around. We had a white wall behind our subject and we have sun coming through in the background. So what you'll see if you look at this behind the scenes image is that the, the, the lights are quite high and down. So they're high enough that they are sort of out of my frame, which was a vertical frame being that was a magazine cover. But because we have so much light in the room, it allowed me to sort of push light towards my subject, be stronger than the background so that the sun behind her becomes now my fourth light in this image and acts as a hair light, shoulder light, backlight, essentially highlight. And the soft quality between three umbrellas. And again, I am almost positive I can say that there's a one-stop difference between the seven foot and the two 43 inch umbrellas all have diffusion, but I'm basically directing uh, front light from the center and then fill light from the sides by being two, you know, two individual lights, one stop beneath the key light, the center light. And that gives a nice wraparound quality to the light, some shape to my subject and uh, sort of a natural feel. And I remember when we shot this, we warmed it up quite a bit to give the feeling. And this goes back to your original question about how do you light people's skin? In this case, it was more that it was a summer issue and they wanted a warm quality of light. Right. Okay. So we, we warmed it up for that reason. So last question for me on umbrellas before we jump into beauty dishes, we're almost at an hour already. So those of you that are listening, this one, you get a lot of bonus material at no <laughs> extra charge. Uh, so here, here's the last question is I, I realize I mentioned that these are reflected umbrellas. They're not shoot through umbrellas. And I don't believe I've ever seen you use a shoot through umbrella. Do you ever shoot through an umbrella as opposed to reflect from an umbrella? Well, you're segu segueing perfectly. We're going to talk about that very next thing. I had never used one and then I got my hands on one. I used it for one assignment, loved it, and it changed my way of thinking going into a personal project that I ended up doing uh, the entire pandemic, basically. And you have some examples of those images that we're going to show. And it's in that combined um, setup that we're going to talk about. So okay. I had one, used it once or twice. It was a small one. And I wasn't, you know, wasn't crazy about it. I, I you know, I love Platon's work. And I know that he uses that. So I sort of, you know, wanted to try it out. Uh, then when they came out, when Westcott, that is to say, came out with the seven foot shoot through, I got my hands on that and figured it, you know, I have these, this one celebrity client that gives me carte blanche to do what I want. Like they, they very rarely give me direction as far as how they want me to shoot something. So it gives me the opportunity to try new things quite often. And I am not somebody that lights the same way all the time. I love changing it up. So uh, utilizing a seven foot shoot through in the same style as Platon, where it's basically right behind me and very tabletop in, in sort of angle, if you want to call it that. It's kind of an extreme 45 over camera tucked in so that my, basically my head is banging up against the bottom of it. Um, sort of changed the style at which I was to do this portrait and gave me an idea. And then I've been using that idea forward with other setups that I do. And now that shoot through umbrella has become sort of a staple on a lot of my shoots because it sort of opened up this idea that I could have a fill light behind camera that's very soft and allows, again, giving me those uh, sort of information aspects to the shadows that I can then take away when I get to post. My style is probably a little darker naturally. So what I used to always do is shoot pretty contrasty. But then I learned that by filling in those shadows in some way, it allowed me to have the information if I needed it and not be so contrasty if the client or the final product didn't want it that contrasty. But it also allowed me to have the option to bring it in and take it out and even control it in areas where it helped me, let's say if the styling wasn't great and I needed a shadow under somebody's arm where their shirt's very wrinkled and I don't want to you know, kill myself retouching wrinkled shirt, I can then deepen that shadow and control it because I have all that information to play with. Right, right. Okay, makes sense. So let's jump into beauty dishes. And here's another Bob Odenkirk shot. But in this case, instead of with the, the stacked umbrella, this is shot with a beauty dish and he is sitting, it's hard to tell from this shot, 
but he's actually sitting next to a pool on that bench. And the beauty dish is pretty far away. And for those of you that have never seen a beauty dish, here's a great example of, of what a beauty dish looks like. This is the, the like a this isn't one of the hard beauty dishes a lot of people think of. This is the Westcott beauty dish. So let's start where we have with the other categories. Explain why a beauty dish and the characteristics of a beauty dish that would make you choose it for a particular shot. So this was actually the first setup we did that day. And in essence, the sun was a little too high. So you can see I kind of intentionally put him in shadow. And that beauty dish is angled pretty much the only place I could put it because of the pool, which unfortunately was covered. Otherwise, I would have used it in the shot. It would have been nice to see him reflected in the pool. Uh, kind of feel like that would have given a bit of a Vince Gilligan feel to it. But, um, you know, unfortunately, it was covered. Um, so I sort of matched the angle of the sun, knowing that the sun was too high to use as my key light. This allowed me to create the feel of sun without using the sun. Now, the distance that it is for my subject, again, it's partially because of the, the pool. I didn't have a gigantic boom that I could boom it out over the pool. So I have a, a small 40-inch uh, arm holding the uh, you know FJ400 along with the, the Rapid Box Beauty Dish. And there is no diffusion on it. Uh, you have the option with the beauty dish of diffusion and a grid, uh, with or without all those kind of very vari vari variations of it. This is straight up so that it has a similar quality of light to the sun, which you can see on the tree behind Odenkirk. So when you jump back to the final image, you can see that it has a similar feel to it, even though the person who's really astute could tell that the angle of the sun is different than the light on him. It almost appears as if it's just sunlight coming through the trees and just happens to be hitting uh, Odenkirk right, right where it should in the face. See, it, so, blends, um, it blends perfectly to me, but uh, this is far away. This would not be. So what would your normal choice of distance on a beauty dish be? Uh, again, it, it's down to the story. Uh, I'm not going to say it's, it's a formula that it has to be three feet, seven feet, 11 feet, it depends what I'm doing. I wanted to match that feel of the sun. That's a far away light because it needs to have a little bit of a hard source to it. The advantage you get with a beauty dish, which is one of the reasons I shoot with it so often, is that it's sort of a hard but soft light, especially when you throw diffusion in front of it. But if you do diffusion and a grid, now you have soft and hard happening at the same time. So you have all these options, which is pretty much why I say it's one of those go-to lights for me or light modifiers for me, because you have the option of straight up, straight up with diffusion, straight up with a grid, um, no grid, no diffusion, you know, like you have just so many options available uh, to, to utilize it and angle straight on angle from the side. It all makes a difference to how it feels. How is, how is the quality of light of a beauty dish differ from an umbrella. The difference with because many people quality, are going to look at this and go, "It looks like a really small umbrella." A lot, yeah, you could. Um, again, it's it's a very sort of um, small group of people that can look at lighting an image and really understand the difference. A lot of times, I say a successful image, we're responding to lighting, or the general public is responding to the lighting without even knowing it. You know, we're so bombarded with imagery, especially with Instagram and TikTok and all these other things that are going on that we might look at an image and think it's great. But if you really pull it up and dissect it, you'll see it often it's not. But the good images we respond to because the light is great. So to answer the question, to me, it's really just about a subtle difference. You know, a small umbrella might be similar to a beauty dish, but it might not have the same sort of depth of feel. Whereas, you know, this is a 24 inch beauty dish. It's not too different from the deep umbrella that we're utilizing. However, it is light bounced into a reflector, then bounced around inside the dish and then shot back at the subject. Whereas the umbrella, as you talked about earlier, is realistically, it's a, it's a, different feel because it's going into the umbrella and then bounce back. So it just changes that those little subtle changes from specular, you know, the, the warmth, specular, cold, hard, all those things are kind of what's affected. And it's, 
it's very minute differences, but to an, a, a keen eye, you might see it. And here's a couple of examples. Another one with Bob Odenkirk. And by the way, just even the use of the wall prop in this one, just beautiful. And okay. here's a beauty shot with a with a model. I love the look personally of a beauty dish. It's just such a, to me, it is, I don't know that I'm good enough that I could call it every time I see it, but usually I can look at a shot and go, oh, that's got to be a beauty dish because it really does have kind of a unique feel to it, especially you know, depending on the distance that you shoot it from. Let's jump into something I've also seen you do on on site before, and that is combining different modifiers together. So a beauty dish, an umbrella, that type of a thing. And here's an example. This is a series that you did of, uh, you know, motorcycle riders. And this shot, by the way, I don't think I've ever told you this. I love the the difference in light. Like, the glove is not dark. I can read it. She's got a leather glove on out in front of the camera. Her face is lit so nicely. It's black and white. I use this shot for the poster for this image, actually. So if you've seen the the poster for the image on YouTube or whatever, you'll know the shot that we're talking about if you're listening on the audio version. Uh, here is an example of the setup when you're doing a combined shoot. So for those of you on audio, let me just explain this one really quick. We are standing where a shoot through very large shoot through umbrella is with uh, an FJ. What is that? A 400 in the umbrella? Correct. Okay. And then in front of that, in front of the, the umbrella, fairly far in front of it, it looks like it could just be angle is a beauty dish. And what's interesting is they're both up high and they're both pointing down the umbrella because it's closer is going to feel, I'm guessing, like a steeper angle to the subject just because of, you know, normal geometry. The closer you are, the sharper the angle is, even if you're at the same height. The farther away you are, the less steep the angle is. But but you've got two of them here. So while I've got this kind of behind the scenes shot up, and then we've got a couple of other shots we'll show from this, explain the idea of mixing modifiers, preferred setup, that type of thing. Sure. So, uh, this goes to what we were talking about before with the shoot-through umbrella. This is the seven-foot shoot-through. I don't always use it at, at a higher angle. This, I think, was specific to whatever the shot was I was doing within this setup. Uh, quite often, it's just flat behind me and straight into the subject, and I'll be standing right in front of it. This is uh, deceptive as far as a behind-the-scenes shot goes. That is literally against my front door, so I can't go any further back, so I'm kind of jammed in the corner holding my phone to take this picture. Um, and the beauty dish is sitting right under the cross beam in my living room, which unfortunately has lower ceilings. So this was, as you mentioned, a, a series of portraits of motorcycle riders that I did uh, in my living room during the pandemic. It was pretty crazy. It kind of developed how I would shoot during COVID and all sorts of other uh, benefits that came from it. But it was a great challenge in itself because my living room has different height ceilings in a couple places, and I'm very limited to what I can do. So to completely describe the scene, you've got the seven-foot shoot-through umbrella at the front door behind camera. Then I would say about maybe eight feet in front of that is the Rapid Box Beauty Dish raised as high as I possibly can until I'm hitting the beam that <laughs> begins the living room, then a white seamless in the living room with two uh, V-flat world V-flats um, alongside each um, part where the subject stands. And then behind that is two 43-inch uh, umbrellas onto the background to create the white background. So it's a lot of stuff in a very small space. And I would argue to say that nobody on the planet would know that this wasn't shot in a studio when you look at the final images and feel like there's lots of depth and room here to do whatever we were doing, uh, when in reality, uh, it's not. <laughs> it's very tight. Um, so, so the, the black yeah. V-flats, those yes. are to prevent spill from the lights lighting the background onto the subject so that the subject is only the umbrella and the beauty dish and the other two umbrellas are only the backdrop. Correct. And they have a second benefit, which is the black side is facing in, and that is intentional to give negative fill. So if you were to use the white side, you would be filling in some of the shadows with the 
light that bounces around and gets reflected off the white side. By utilizing black, it allows me to have a better separation of my subject from the white background. So ultimately, I remove the people from the background anyway in order to get a, a much more pure white, uh, which is hard to do in a space like this because I don't want a ton of bounce back from that white background. So I typically go like just a little bit off white so that in post, I have an easier time separating them um, in getting them off that background. And the black gives me a negative fill to either side of my subject, which allows for sort of a dark edge along my subjects. And going to the final images, what you're really responding to in the lighting that you were talking about was the fact that the key light, which is the Rapid Box Beauty Dish, is really focused on my subject's face. That umbrella is filling in a lot of the shadows that are created by that beauty dish, which does have no diffusion, but it does have a grid on it. So it's focused light right on my subject's face. The drop off of that is right around belly button, I would say. And in post, I'm purposely honing that light in. So all the right. shapes are there. And I know what I do in post is going to focus that light in more to my subject's face. And the drop off happens, but it's not complete shadow because the fill from that seven foot umbrella allows for me to have that information in there for, you know, the example of the image on the screen, the woman's wearing jeans. There's a lot of detail in those jeans because of that fill light. So when, if you're a fashion photographer, the use of a fill light is tremendous if you're showing clothes because you can still have, and this is where the beauty of this combination works out in my book, is that you could still have very directed light but still have a ton of information in the shadows so that if this was, let's say, a clothing company image for the jacket, you would be able to understand the material that's being used in this image. Because if you think about it, the spread out light fills a lot of those nooks and crannies in, right? If you had woven material, but the direct light, which is stronger than the fill light, creates shadows. So those little shadows that are happening in the woven material are there, but they're filled in. So you have this one-two punch. If you think of a waffle, that's a good way to think about it because a right. waffle would have shadows in those little squares, right? But if you fill in those shadows, you have information in there that you can utilize. And then by having all of that in the original file, you can then play with it in post and control it to where it sort of fits perfectly. It's, it's, I, I liken lighting very much to cooking, you know? Some people like a little extra salt. Some people like a little extra pepper. This allows you to have those controls, turn it up, turn it down, all those things. So how far away, you know, when you're looking at this, which is the model view of this type of a setup where you've got mm -hmm. the shoot through umbrella way in the background, this is another behind the scenes shot. You've got the camera right in front of it. You've got the uh, beauty dish over you with a grid and diffusion, it looks like. No diffusion. No diffusion, but with a grid. Mm -hmm. Two questions. How far from the background is the model here? And what's the stop difference between that beauty dish and that umbrella? Okay, so the um, subject is standing where I'm standing to take this picture, which I would say is probably about four feet from the Rapid Box beauty dish. And okay. then it would probably be another six feet to the background. So I, that's as far as I can push it. In an ideal world, that would be 12. 10, 10 12. Yeah, okay. 10 so, 12 so yeah. and that's the idea of the 10 to 12 is to prevent a shadow on that background. Uh, not only to prevent the shadow, but also to reduce the kickback that happens from right. the white, from the white the back. coming back, considering you're lighting it white. Okay. Um, and now, is there a stop a proper, uh, Yes. So the background, I would say, Oh, oh, sorry, from the key light and the fill? Yeah, and the background, actually, now that yeah. you bring it up. yeah. Sure. Um, so first off, I always read from the back first, whether I'm shooting natural okay. light or strobe or anything else. You always look at the background first because that, that determines what you're going to do in the foreground. Um, so the background uh, I will set up first. I'll take a reading on that. Typically, when I want that little like white but a little bit off-white, I'll be about – a stop below my key light. So my key light here, if I remember correct, was uh, 16.2. Okay. 
um, I think we're at ISO either 400 or 640, possibly 800, somewhere in those in that range. The background, so if my key light's 16.2, then my background's going to be 11.2 or somewhere thereabouts. And my key, uh, fill light is going to be two stops below that. So working from the back forward, background is 11.2, F11.2. Key light is going to be F16.2. The fill light is going to be a stop below. So it's going to match the 11.2 of the background. But, and this is key, when you're working in ratios between a key light and a fill light, you need to read them individually and together. And this is why it's so important to have a light meter, which is why I work with Sekonic so much, because that, if you want to talk about mistakes, is a mistake I see a lot of photographers make. They're reading off the back of their camera and saying, oh, well, it looks good here, and that's it. But they're not understanding what each individual light is doing. And that is so important when you do ratios. So I will read 16.2 on that uh, beauty dish. Then I will turn it off. I'll read 11.2 on the fill. And then I will turn both on, do another reading, which typically is going to be too high. And it's going to go probably 16.8 or 22 when it's combined. And then I have that decision to make of, do I want to bring it down so I can shoot at F16? Or do I want to bring it uh, where my f-stop is going to be a little bit higher so that I can shoot at a higher um, depth of field, which is sort of what changed for me when I first shot with that shoot-through umbrella at this in this style. It allowed me to shoot at a higher f-stop. I, I typically shoot around f7.1. It's just sort of my sweet spot. Um, so I approached this project saying, I'm going to shoot something with more depth of field than I normally shoot. And how can I do that? I needed more power to do that. And how can I get more power by adding more lights? But I don't want to dictate just, you know, blasting light. I need to right. still direct right. the light the way I want to. So this one-two punch of the, the beauty dish and the umbrella allows me to still have the light that I wanted with that beauty dish, but more available light in the frame by that shoot-through umbrella, which then allowed me to increase that aperture. I, I love the way that you think on lighting. Uh, I want to talk about your your new light really quick. Sure. Uh, we're going to show a couple examples. You know, we we pulled up earlier this this product shot that I took from the Westcott website, and to the folks at Web Westcott, I apologize that I took the shot from the website. But this is the twenty four inch deep silver umbrella. I think I said beauty dish a second ago. I meant to say umbrella, but. This particular shot does such a nice job with images. So, you know, you end up with shots like this and, and the control of light here is just so nice. When you look at, like I shoot music for a living, guitars can be hard. They're, that's got lacquer on it, right? I mean, there's a lot of reflective surface on that guitar. The way that even the inside of his sleeve that you can see, the way that you've controlled highlights and the softness of the shadows here. And this is basically the setup that you're using. It's just the one 24 inch deep umbrella uh, over him, the silver umbrella over him on a boom in front of what looks like, what is that? Just a wall of leaves. That's not a, is that a backdrop or is that real? Yeah. There's some studios out in LA that uh, are for rent and, and they have these different rooms, like themed rooms. And this one just happens to have sort of like a, a corner jungle. It's these plastic leaves. Um, and it, it's cool. I mean, it just makes for you to be able to shoot a variety of setups in one space. This is in the same space in a different corner. They just have this sort of Moroccan themed corner. So um, we were actually on the way out of the shoot. And I said to, uh, this was a part of a shoot we did for Westcott directly in, in the development of this product. And basically I said, uh, you know what, that wall over there is really cool. We've got like, you know, 10 minutes left. This is a good idea for the video. Let's show how fast we can work with this thing. So we said basically, okay, we've got a couple minutes left on the shoot. My subject's got to leave. Watch me do a portrait of him on the fly without a stand. And I wanted to show how you could use a small light source with a modifier like this and make what looks like a very elaborate setup that you'd take hours to do. And I think at one point in the video, um, 
I actually took my hand off to the side to show the difference between holding it straight on and holding it to the side and what a different feel you get when you change the direction of that light as well. And in both cases, here we have a situation where we have a person wearing a hat. So where I put the height of that light is going to change. If I'm going to be using a second light to fill that in, that might be one way to go. But if I'm running on the fly and I only have the one light source, how am I going to solve this? So that might change. And that's the great thing with something like a 24-inch umbrella with diffusion is that you know, you can go at a 45 degree angle, but you have to think about those shadows that are going to be created by that. Whereas if you flatten that light, and this is goes back to your sort of original question to me about putting the light here or there, this is right over camera, but it's not on camera. And it's, right. there's a difference, you know, it's, it's small, but there is a difference. Well, and, you get a nice, you, know, you get a nice shadow on the side of his face here. The catch light in his eye is awesome. The yeah. shadow from the brim of the skimmer that he's wearing is a, well above his eyes. It doesn't encroach his, his eyebrows. And then, and here's the setup, by the way, for those that are, that are watching on the video. But what I love about this, when you talked about, I just moved it to the side a little bit. That's it from the side a little bit. And look at the shadows this thing makes. I mean, really, honestly, that is a beautiful, soft, wonderful light. And again, I love the catch light that this particular modifier uh, makes. Just wonderful. By the way, if people are interested, there is a link to this new 24-inch silver deep umbrella on the Westcott site. I've got a link to it on my site at BehindTheShot.tv. And uh, I'm so happy for you, man. Congratulations on, I mean- Creating your own light modifier, that's pretty damn <laughs> awesome, right? Yeah. And like I said, we, you know, I really got to field test it on this book project to be mentioned later. Um, and with it, I was not only able to do some stuff with it very close up to what I was photographing, but also from a distance in the same way that we looked at that example of Odenkirk sitting on the bench, where I needed it to mimic the feel of sunlight, but still look beautiful on somebody's face. And that little difference of being able to modify the light source, whereas if I actually used the sun, which was at the identical angle for this one particular image I'm talking about, but because I was able to light my subject with the umbrella, with the diffusion, I was able to control how soft it was on his face. So even though it was a hard light to mimic the sun, there was a softness to it because of that diffusion that that sort of uh, led to a better image than if it was just the sun. And the reason I say that is I had an older gentleman. I wanted to create a, a shadow under his chin. The sun may or may not have done that. I can't move the sun. Where he was standing was sort of a fixed position. So I really didn't have a lot of variation of what I could do with him. So in that case, being able to control the light that's on his face was imperative. And by being able to do it with this very easily, and this is in the Dominican Republic on a remote location. (laughs) So it was really like a perfect, you know, one, two travel backpack situation. (laughs) So that's kind of where the thought process was, was where can we use this thing out in the field now ambitiously I took the FJ 400s on that trip. Uh, I had an assistant with me the whole time. So he had a backpack with two FJ 400s. I had all my cameras in my backpack and we traveled. All our light uh, modifiers was in one case, one thin case. That was it. We didn't want to have to truck around a big wheeled cart or anything like that. Uh, We didn't even um, carry anything more than a small kickstand with us. Everything else, we either handheld that light or had it on a boom uh, like a travel boom that had right. uh, like some grip on it so that he could hold it. So we kind of s- traveled mostly without stands. We, we very rarely used any stands. Uh, we brought a couple clamps with us. That was about it. But this um, really opened my eyes as to, you know, I, I do a lot of shoots where I might have to hike up the mountain and to be able to do that with just a backpack and have a lot of control. And, yeah, it's a good thing. All right. So let's move into the last speed round. Okay. Couple of quick questions. 
Answer them as fast as they come to your mind. Of all the lighting setups that you normally do, you're suddenly told, I'm sorry, none of these other lighting setups are available to you. You must only use one. What would your go-to lighting setup be? It would probably be that Rapid Box Beauty Dish, uh, mostly because I can do probably 16 different things with it. And like I said, I'm never satisfied with just repeating the same lighting setup every time. Uh, so the, yeah, that, they, they nailed it with the Rapid Box Beauty Dish for sure. Okay. Biggest mistake you almost made or did make in your photography? Oh my God, there's so many. <laughs> I don't think I can just, I, I'm a big proponent of uh, fail to learn. I think that that's super, super important. I think people should not be afraid whatsoever of failing. So uh, I could probably give you one a week <laughs> if you really want to go that way. But um, yeah, I don't. I could not say there was one. I've, I've pretty much failed a ton, and that's how I've learned. You know, if if you you fall down, you just get back up. Okay. Favorite composition rule, if you have one. I do like very much so to juxtapose my subjects in sort of an odd place in the frame sometimes. Uh, my mind often thinks commercially, where's the copy going to go? Where's the headline going to go? That kind of stuff. I would say if I had one cheat, it would be uh, something uh, Harry Benson taught me long ago. That's That was who I call my mentor is a famous photographer who, you know, came to America with the Beatles and shot every president from Eisenhower to, to Trump. And he often told me he shoot, he would shoot things horizontally on purpose to get a double page spread. Now it's not as applicable nowadays, but there was a point in time way, way back when you would get paid more on a job if they used the images beyond one page. So you might get a $500 day rate, for a magazine assignment. And if they ran it double page, they called it double truck back then, you would get an extra 500 bucks. Uh, so he would often navigate towards these horizontal images that he knew could be a spread so that he would get more money. So I, I, I pulled that trick for a good 12 years, I would say. Favorite drink? Uh, right now it's bang energy drink. It's just so bad. It's, it's my one vice. Uh, I don't eat sugar. I don't, I don't like, I barely touch desserts or anything like that. But yeah, Bang Energy keeps me alive right now. <laughs> Favorite singer, band, or artist? Bruce Springsteen. Wow, that was a quick one. Okay. No, that's, that may be the fastest bringer. anybody's ever answered that yeah, question. Uh, he's my life. <laughs> Soundtracks of my life, as they say. <laughs> Is there any photographer that more people need to know about? Harry is definitely one of them. Harry 100%. Benson. Harry Benson, 1,000%. Okay. I think you know his images, even if you don't know his images. And um, probably one of, coming speaking from a, as a former photo editor, he's probably one of the most underrated photographers out there who is famous. So it, it astounds me when people don't know who he is because I knew coming out of college who he was when he walked. I was working at GQ magazine at the time, and he walked in and my mouth dropped to the floor. Uh, and that began our friendship, which uh, I just saw him. He was happened to be out here speaking at the Ventura County Museum um, about his career. And I w it was amazing. I was able to introduce him uh, to my kids um, who are you know, 13 and 16 at this point. They know who he is because his pictures are on my wall and his books are around my house. And, you know, I was like, guys, you just met a living legend. And, you know, sitting there, my son who, who loves history, for him to be able to see and hear the stories behind some of these images, he, he was blown away. Okay. And uh, by the way, speaking of, you know, doing a speaking project or, or something like that, I should mention you were just at B&H doing a live stream with B&H. And I think that's available online, probably on the B&H YouTube channel, right? Correct. Uh, at B&H event space is their Instagram and their Facebook and all of the various ones I've done. We started doing these live shoots during the pandemic and it kind of stuck. The other day was trippy. I, I don't know how much you stuck through it, but it, we had so many Zoom problems. It was crazy. And every time I took pictures, we'd cut off Zoom. <laughs> uh, so it was a challenge, uh, but I have already thought of some ideas on how to refine that. Normally we shoot in my living room and it's much easier because the router is right there. So, um, but yeah, I do, I do appear there quite often. I will tell you, 
recording or live streaming, sometimes tech just doesn't work. So if yeah. people want to reach out and connect with Ian, uh, there's obviously social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, your website, ianspanier.com. What are you on Instagram? Uh, at Ian Spanier. That's the best place. That, that's really where I'm at the most. I'm not actually on Facebook very often. I kind of have that auto feed going to it. it. Half the time it doesn't even work. So I sort of on Facebook only for the groups that I'm part of, like Westcott, and um, I'll be speaking at PPA uh, this 2023. Oh, nice. Also, I just got um, the word I'm going to speak at Shutterfest uh, 2023 as well. So those Chicago, are going to be right? Uh, I think it's going to be in St. Louis this year okay, or next year. Um, so that's April, I think of 23 and pretty regularly on B and H. Uh, I was here at Canon up until, uh, quarantine and then they kind of stopped the in-person stuff, but I was at Canon quite often. Um, so yeah, B and H is, is the main one, but then social media wise, Instagram, definitely the best. That, that's where I'm at every day. And then, of course, Facebook and Twitter, Ian Spanier photo. But it's funny, you mentioned Canon. He's talking about the Canon Learning Center in Costa Mesa, California. Mm -hmm. And someday I got to tell you the story about when I went down to have lunch with uh, RC. Do you know RC Concepcion? I don't know him personally, but I, I okay. guess from- I went to meet him down there and he had laptop problems. So instead of, we, we ended up being able to get food, but we spent the day trying to drive around finding somebody that had- a new MacBook Pro in stock so that he could <laughs> replace his MacBook Pro. Uh, Rick Salmon used to speak there a lot too. Uh, Ian, yeah. I cannot say thank you enough. Your second time doing this, and this one went way longer than I had told you that it was going to go. My apologies, but I really appreciate it so very much. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to get together in person again sometime soon. Absolutely. I've actually, I know that there's a request for me to come back out to Fullerton, so I'm waiting to hear from Westcott. So I'll keep you posted if that happens. That'd be awesome, dude. Uh, Ian Spanier, if you want to connect with him again, ianspanier.com or at Ian Spanier on Instagram. That'll get you everywhere that you need to know. If you want to find me, the podcast, all the show notes from today or any show that I do, behindtheshot.tv, my personal website, stevebrazel.com, like Brazil, but two L's. Social media wise, I'm like Ian. I don't really do anything on Facebook anymore, but the account is still there. It's behind the shot TV there or on uh, Instagram or Twitter for the podcast. And for me, it's at Steve Brazel on either Twitter or Instagram. I spend a lot of time on Twitter. I absolutely love Twitter. And of course, if you're watching on YouTube, please make sure that you head down, drop a, a thumbs up if you would, subscribe if you like what I'm doing. I would appreciate it very much. Wherever you get your podcasts, you can get this show in audio or video only. And if you are on Apple Podcasts or wherever you do get your podcasts, if it has the ability for you to do a star rating and a written review, if you like it, please drop us a five-star rating and a written review. It would be very, very much appreciated. I'm Steve Brazel. Make sure you join us next time as we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind the shot. We'll see you then. Thank you.